everyone, my name is Rebecca and welcome back to... Okay, I gotta take this thing off, it doesn't feel right. Apologies in advance if I seem a little bit low-key in this episode. I think I'm coming down with a little bit of a cold and as those of you who follow me on Tumblr will know I'm already stretched a little bit thin between full-time work and full-time grad school right now but we're pushing through. I've talked before about how BBC Sherlock is structured like a romance and how the minor characters on the show are often put there to mirror John or Sherlock. Today's topic is kind of related to both. We're going to be looking at how to make a relationship important in a work of fiction and more specifically how to make your audience constantly feel the urge to find a relationship to root for. One of the main ways you can tell that BBC Sherlock is a romance is through all the allusions to romance and relationships on the show. Because the vast majority of these are going badly or end tragically, it causes the audience to subconsciously look for a good relationship to balance things out. The more allusions to bad relationships, the more important the exemplar relationship will have to be to restore balance. This is why the vast majority of the audience clings to a relationship on the show, even the ones who say they only enjoy it for the cases or the friendship. But another thing the writers have done to further their main goal with the show is to make almost every potential major relationship, and by that I mean a relationship involving one of the two main characters, completely unviable. Do people ignore this? Absolutely. Usually because the alternative relationship is straight and the one they should be looking for is between two men, but the writers do everything they can to make the audience feel like John and Sherlock should end up together. Today we're going to be looking at the allusions to romance on the show, how they set the audience's expectations to see a relationship important to the show do well, and how Mark and Stephen have written every possibility but one in such a way that it's clear that they aren't the one to root for. Let's start very quickly on John's blog. On January 28th of 2010, John mentions that his friend Bill has gotten married. Stuff's happening to him. John needs something to happen to him. And the very next day, it does. He meets Sherlock Holmes. That immediately sets the reader's expectation that this will also be a romantic relationship. In the show, meanwhile, immediately after the first credits, we see our first unhappy love affair with a married man flirting with his co-worker. I love you. When? Get a cab. <laughs> Things don't work out here, so already the audience is looking for a comparison. And pay attention to the setup. He loved his family and his work. And that he should have taken his own life in this way. He's a mystery and a shock to all who knew him. The focus isn't placed on the married couple, but on the two co-workers who are in love. So the happy ending would involve a mirror of that situation, where someone leaves an unhappy marriage to be with the person they love. It's subtle the first time, but it gets less and less so the more often the situation happens in the background. And it does. A lot. Our first potential major relationship is between Sherlock and Molly. But that's quickly revealed to be going nowhere. Listen, I was wondering, maybe later, when you're finished... You're wearing lipstick. You weren't wearing lipstick before. I, uh, I refreshed it a bit. Sorry, you were saying? I was wondering if you'd like to have coffee. Black, two sugars, please. I'll be upstairs. So maybe Sherlock is a loner who doesn't like to do things with others, except in the very next scene, he readily invites John into his life. How did you... Ah, Molly, coffee, thank you. What happened to the lipstick? It wasn't working for me. Really? I thought it was a big improvement. Mouth's too small now. Okay. How do you feel about the violin? We'll meet there tomorrow evening, seven o'clock. Sorry, got a dash. I think I left my riding crop in the mortuary. And I know that your therapist thinks your limp psychosomatic quite correctly, I'm afraid. It's enough to be going on with, don't you think? The name's Sherlock Holmes and the address is 221B Baker Street. So the contrast here makes it even more clear. Sherlock isn't interested in Molly, but he is interested in John. And that interest already has a romantic undercurrent because of his romantic rejection of Molly. Even if we didn't know he's going to be asking John out for dinner by the end of the episode. If you want an in-depth look on why Sherlock and Molly don't work well together, I recommend my video on Molly Hooper. John goes back to his apartment and starts researching Sherlock, deciding if this is the life he wants. And on the other side of town, Jennifer Wilson is presented with the pills. The 
timing here makes it clear that the pills Hope offers his victims represent the chance that John and Sherlock are taking on their new relationship. It could be fatal, but it could also be the thing that saves them. Jennifer chose wrong and, by coincidence, was having a string of unhappy affairs. We'll later get strong coding that Sherlock chooses wrong, because John chose the wrong building at the same time Sherlock was choosing the pills, and his incorrect assumption was that Hope was offering him poison. Oh, interesting. He should have put more stock in Hope. Eh? Eh? No. Sherlock and John go to visit Baker Street. Both of them like the place. And Mrs. Hudson hints where this relationship is headed. There's another bedroom upstairs if you've been needing two bedrooms. Of course we'll be needing two. Oh, don't worry. There's all sorts around here. Mrs. Turner next door's got married. Even if we didn't know that the married ones are representing Sherlock and John because Mrs. Turner was another name given to Mrs. Hudson in the stories, this again reinforces a subtle expectation that the characters will end up together. Harry and Clara have already broken up when the show starts. We don't know what went wrong for them, but we do know that John's phone is marked by the signs of a failed relationship. This man sitting next to me wouldn't treat his one luxury item like this, so it's had a previous owner. Next bit's easy, you know it already. The engraving. Again, telling us he needs to find a happy relationship. Sherlock is also assuming that an unhappy couple is straight. Did I get anything wrong? Harry and me don't get on. Never have. Clara and Harry split up. Three months ago, they're getting a divorce. Harry is a drinker. Spot on, and I didn't expect to be right about everything. Harry's short for Harriet. Harry's your sister. It's a fair assumption, at least going by the statistics on this show. At the crime scene, we have even more co-workers having an affair, even though one of them is married. And is your wife away for long? Oh, don't pretend you worked that out. Somebody told you that. Your deodorant told me that. My deodorant? It's for men. Well, of course it's for men. I'm wearing it. So, Sergeant Donovan. Later on in the night, John tries to flirt with Anthea, proving that he associates being back in action with being romantically and sexually active. But like with Sherlock and Molly, it goes nowhere. In fact, John easily gives up on her to follow after Sherlock twice. Hey, um, do you ever get any uh, free time? <laughs> oh, yeah, lots. Bye. Okay. What are you doing? Hello. Yes, we, we met earlier on this evening. Oh. Okay, good night. Good night, Dr. Watson. So dim sum. We're already getting hints of who our endgame couple will be. Meanwhile, Hope has turned to murder because the person he loved left him. She took the kids, but you still love them and it still hurts. No, there's something else. You didn't just kill four people because your bitter bitterness is a paralytic. Love is a much more vicious motivator. Of all the clues so far, this is the most blatant. Sherlock saying that love is the most vicious motivator a person can have makes it central to the story, cementing the fact that the story will most likely be resolved through a romance. In the next episode, we're introduced to Su Lin and Andy, who are clearly interested in each other, but Su Lin is afraid to be open about her feelings because of her past. 400 years old, they're letting you use it to make yourself a brew. Some things are supposed to sit behind glass. They're made to be touched, to be handled. I don't suppose that you, you want to have a drink? Not tea, obviously. Um, in a pub with me tonight. Um, you wouldn't like me all that much. Can I maybe decide that for myself? I can't. This concealment ends up being a huge mistake, and Su Lin is killed by her brother. Han. Um, Jingli. She really should have talked to Andy. Because the episode takes time to let the audience feel the weight of Su Lin's death, we the audience again feel the need to find a happy relationship to balance it. And at first, it looks like we might have one. John tries to go on another date in this episode, again showing that part of what he needs to be fulfilled is a relationship. But not only does Sherlock suggest that he go on a date with him instead, 
I need to get some air. We're going out tonight. Actually, I've uh, got a date. What? It's where two people who like each other go out and have fun. That's what I was suggesting. But when Sherlock crashes the date, John spends most of his time focusing on Sherlock and not Sarah. You said circus. This is not a circus. Look at the size of this crowd. Sherlock, this is art. This is not their day job. No, sorry, I forgot. They're not a circus. They're a gang of international smugglers. Sarah eventually starts to get the hint. Well, I think perhaps I should leave you to it. John doesn't let her leave, though, and they end up being kidnapped. In fact, something goes wrong every time John goes to see Sarah, whether it's an explosion on Baker Street or getting kidnapped yet again. She's definitely not the option to root for for John, then. So we look for other options, even if you continue to ignore the most obvious one. We get more hints in the great game of unhappy domesticity. Yeah, well, then, then I've done it. Did it. Did it. Stop them! Over and over. Molly's new relationship really isn't going well. Not only is he the main villain, but he's also gay and in love with Sherlock. Hi. So you're Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Molly's told me all about you. You're on one of your cases. Jim works in IT upstairs. That's how we met. Office romance. <laughs> <laughs> gay. Sorry, what? Nothing. Um, hey. Hey. Bye. It's nice to meet you. This suggests that Molly might have a type. Gay men. Ian Monkford also really wanted to get away from his wife. Mrs. Monkford cashes in the life insurance and she splits it with Jane's cars. Uh, Mrs. Monkford. Oh, yeah, she's in on it too. Like Sulin and Andy, Lucy and Andrew West, and tragically because Andrew is hiding things. Last seen by his fiancee at 10 30 yesterday evening. Lucy and I've got to go out. i got to see someone. Westy. Unlike some of the couples in this episode, for them, it wasn't that their relationship was bad, but that someone came between them. A sibling caught up with serious people. I just got out of my depth. I owe people thousands. Serious people. Just like with Sulin and Andy, and Raul and Kenny. Who wanted revenge? Raul, the houseboy. Kenny Prince was the butt of his sister's jokes, week in, week out, virtual bullying campaign. Finally, he had enough, fell out with her badly. It's all on the website. She threatened to disinherit Kenny. Raoul had grown accustomed to a certain lifestyle. Because that specific situation happens again and again, if the audience is paying attention, they know to be looking for it to play out again with the main characters. And since this is a happy story, ultimately, the characters will overcome the difficulty. In the midst of all these violent relationships and miscommunications, Sherlock and John also aren't understanding each other. They're both worried someone else is coming between them. In Sherlock's case, it's Sarah. In John's case, it's Moriarty. Where are you going? Out. I need some air. Excuse oh, sorry, me. love. <laughs> oh, you two had a little domestic. So why is he doing this, then? Playing this game with you? Do you think he wants to be caught? I think he wants to be distracted. <laughs> I hope you'll be very happy together. Sorry, what? That's something that needs to be fixed. And all these failed relationships in the background suggest that it will be fixed when both of them are in a relationship. But if they're both so worried when someone appears to be coming between them, how would a relationship with anyone but each other work? And then, of course, there's the biggest example of how comparison makes a relationship between Sherlock and John seem inevitable. Moriarty and his obsession with Sherlock. Not only does he approach him in disguise to flirt with him, he flirts with him at literally every chance he gets. Gave you my number. I thought you might call. Is that a British Army Browning L9A1 in your pocket? Or are you just pleased to see me? But the flirting's over, Sherlock. Daddy's had enough now. So take this as a friendly warning, my dear. And make sure to mention that he thinks they were made for each other. We were made for each other, Sherlock. His ultimate threat to Sherlock involves his heart. Kill you? Well, no, don't be obvious. I mean, I'm going to kill you anyway someday. I don't want to rush it, though. I'm saving it up for something special. No, 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 no. If you don't stop prying, I will burn you. I will burn the heart out of you. 
So looking at this story with a simple win-lose state approach, Sherlock loses if Moriarty succeeds in burning out his heart and winning him over. Sherlock then wins if his heart isn't burned and he's free to choose who he loves. And the person he chooses would most likely be the person that Moriarty has already singled out as Sherlock's weakness. I can stop John Watson too. Stop his heart. Who are you? I will burn the heart out of you. I have been reliably informed that I don't have one. But we both know that's not quite true. For Sherlock to truly defeat Moriarty, he has to end up with John. That's the goal. The next episode is a true study in contrast. It starts off with a woman whose husband has been cheating on her. I think my husband might be having an affair. Yes. Sherlock is sure of this because John has been dating a string of women in quick succession. Of course no one is faithful. At this point we're really missing a couple that isn't cheating on or trying to kill each other. We still don't get to that in this episode but we do get more hints of who that will be. Irene's role in the story is made clear to us right away in her introduction. The thing she's most famous for is breaking up a couple. What do you know about this woman? Nothing whatsoever. Then you should be paying more attention. She's been at the center of two political scandals in the last year and recently ended the marriage of a prominent novelist by having an affair with both participants separately. That's what she'll be trying to do the whole episode. And again, here's a quick recap on why Sherlock and Irene aren't the couple to root for. More details can be found in the video on a scandal in Belgravia, but I understand that's an hour and a half long, so here's a quick paragraph. For starters, both of them are gay. Irene explicitly so. I'm not actually gay. Well, I am. That really should be all we need, but in case it wasn't, Sherlock and Irene's first interaction is Irene trying to scare Sherlock. Oh, it's always hard to remember an alias when you've had a fright. Sherlock insulting her. Because you catered to the whims of the pathetic and take your clothes off to make an impression. Stop boring me and think. It's the new sexy. Sherlock telling Irene that she shouldn't think he's interested. I'm flattered. Don't be. And Irene drugging and beating him. What? What is that? What? Give it to me. Now, give it to me. No. Give it to me. Uh, no. Oh, for goodness uh. sake. Drop it. I said drop it. Ah, thank you, dear. Completely unnecessarily, by the way. She, she could have just drugged him. She didn't, she didn't have to hit him, but... She then proceeds to text him for months, and Sherlock ignores every single text. She then lies to him repeatedly and reveals she was working for Moriarty the entire time. Uh, Jim Moriarty sends his love. Sherlock saves her, yes, but mostly because that makes the episode a happy version of the private life of Sherlock Holmes, indicating that other parts of that film will finally be resolved. But at no point are they genuinely interested in each other. All Irene does is lie, and all Sherlock does is ignore Irene for John. He never seeks her out again after this episode and is content in his life with John. Besides, Irene already has a girlfriend, a woman who helps her with her work. Kate, we're going to have a visitor. I'll need a bit of time to get ready. A long time. Ages. No. Works for me. Everything works on you. Shade? Blood. What are you gonna wear? My battle dress. Mm -hmm. Lucky boy. Most people seem to assume that they broke up, but a scandal in Bohemia ends with Irene Norton running away with her new husband to America. I think it's reasonable to assume that Irene didn't disappear alone. John doesn't know any of this though and spends the whole episode getting jealous. 57? Sorry, what? 57 of those texts, the ones I've heard. What, what's up, Sean? said, excuse me. Do you have a reply? Again, contrast plays a role. John counts every text Irene sends Sherlock and asks if he's replied to her, but he can't remember if the woman he's dating is the one with the dog or not. I'll walk your dog for you. I, I, I've said it now. I'll even walk I don't have a dog. No, because that was the last one. Okay. Jesus. He's unhappy with these women because of his preoccupation with Sherlock. The direct connection between these two things makes it clear that John would rather be in a relationship with Sherlock. In case implications weren't enough though, the dialogue spells it out. You're a great boyfriend. Okay, that's good. I mean, I always thought I was great. Now Sherlock Holmes is a very lucky man. 
Jeanette, please. No, I mean it. It's heartwarming. You'll do anything for him. Later in the episode, Irene and John meet, one lying to achieve her own ends, and one doing anything to ensure Sherlock's happiness. Tell him you're alive. He'd come after me. I'll come after you if you don't. Mm, I believe you. Irene tells John to look at both of them as a way of insinuating they're both in love. Uh, who, who the hell knows about Sherlock Holmes? But for the record, if anyone out there still cares, I'm not actually gay. Well, I am. Look at us both. But we should actually look for another reason. We see in comparison which of these two actually cares about Sherlock. Even though most of the audience will go into the episode assuming Irene is a love interest, this scene practically screams at you to notice that John is the one who is heartbroken. What do I say? What do you normally say? You've texted him a lot. John is the one who actually cares about Sherlock. It's for his own safety. Says this. Tell him you're alive. I can't. Fine. I'll tell him. And I still won't help you. And John is the one that Sherlock actually responds to. You flirted with Sherlock Holmes. At him. He never replies. Now, Sherlock always replies to everything. He's Mr. Punchline. He will outlive God trying to have the last word. Sometimes I don't talk for days on and Would that bother you? You just carry on talking when I'm away. I don't know. How often are you away? Where's John? He went out a couple of hours ago. I was just talking to him. You said you do that. Does that make me special? I don't know, maybe. If he ignores and rejects Irene's advances, what does the contrast of him always responding to John, even when he's not there, imply? Which love affair are we meant to put our faith in? Sherlock, meanwhile, still can't talk to John, and at this point starts acknowledging all the broken relationships around them, bitterly pointing out how they're all doomed to fail. I wasn't expecting to see you. I thought you were gonna be in Dorset for Christmas. That's first thing in the morning, me and the wife. We're back together, it's all sorted. No, she's sleeping with a PE teacher. So you've got a new boyfriend, Molly, and you're serious about him. Hmm, <laughs> Casbah Nights. Pretty racy for first thing on a Monday morning, wouldn't you agree? I've written a little blog on the identification of perfumes. It's on the website. You should look it up. Please. I wouldn't put any hopes on that cruiser, Mr. Chatterjee. He's got a wife in Doncaster that nobody knows about. Sure. Well, nobody except me. He does this because he's bitter of his own prospects. He wants a relationship, but he can't have it. It's at this point that John starts turning down other relationships, just like Henry Knight, who changes his mind about the girl on the train. The girl, female handwriting is quite distinctive. Wrote her phone number down on the napkin. I could tell from the angle she wrote at that she was sat across from you on the other side of the aisle. Later, after she got off, I imagine you used the napkin to mop up your spilled coffee, accidentally smudging the numbers. You've been over the last four digits yourself in another pen, so you wanted to keep the number. Just now, though, you used the napkin to blow your nose. Maybe you're not that into her after all. When he flirts with a woman, it's to help Sherlock. Batman. And it only lasts about five minutes before she realizes that he's in love with someone else. Sherlock Holmes. It's Sherlock who? <laughs> Private detective. This is his PA. PA. Well, live in PA. Perfect. Live in. Because John has briefly given up, though, we get just a peek at the end game. What with the monster and the ruddy prisoner? I don't know how we sleep nice. Do you, Gary? Like a baby. That's not true. He's a snorer. Hey, pushed. Is yours a snorer? Got any crisps? Again, it's important that we only get this glimpse of happiness after John has stopped trying to date other people. The only difference between the married couple and John and Sherlock is that Billy and Gary have been open about their feelings. That's all that's missing for the happy ending that John wants. John says himself that his life with Sherlock isn't compatible with long-term relationships with other people, so maybe he'll magically find a woman who doesn't mind playing second fiddle to Sherlock. Or just using Occam's razor, we know that he's going to end up with Sherlock. But they aren't to their happy ending yet. Again, Sherlock Sherlock and John's relationship struggles are set against a swarm of other romantic problems. At the trial, Sherlock points out the jurors who are having an affair with each other. And married into having an affair with each other, it would seem. Oh, and they've just had tea and biscuits. Again, having an affair with someone they work with. Kitty propositions Sherlock, offering to set the record straight. You and John Watson, just platonic. Could I put you down for a no there as well? There's all sorts of gossip in the press about you. Sooner or later, you're gonna need someone on your side. Someone to set the record straight. Or hide his sexuality to decode that fairly 
to go with that. Since she made the offer to be his public beard, I suppose it's only fitting that she ends up dating Moriarty. Jordan, they didn't have any ground coffee, so I just got more. In the empty hearst, after years of mourning, John has entered a new relationship. And this could finally be it, right? All the hints that John needs a relationship could be leading to this. And Sherlock and Molly could work things out somehow, even though they both know he's in love with John. You look sad when you think he can't see you. And everyone will be in a relationship without it having to be gay. Goody! Yeah, that's dismissed before it even starts. For starters, the episode begins by blatantly dismissing Sherlock and Molly being in a relationship as a ridiculous theory. <laughs> And when we see John for the first time in years, he still looks as empty as he did at the end of Reichenbach. It's here that Mary comes into frame, presented as a crutch John is using to cope with Sherlock's loss. It's not off to a great start if we're meant to be building up to a straight ending. It gets more blatant. She's how he's moving on from Sherlock. So why now? What changed your mind? Well, I've got some news. Oh, God. Is it serious? What? No. No, I'm, I'm not ill. I've, uh, well, I'm moving on. You're emigrating. Nope. Uh, no, I've, uh, I've met someone. That's a romantic phrase. And that's not even knowing Sherlock is alive. Sherlock, meanwhile, is being hurt by a man in a dissatisfying marriage who had an unhappy love affair when he was in the military. See you, John. I see you. Sherlock frees himself from his torture by confirming to the man that his wife has been lying to him. Back in London, John starts his proposal by being sure to mention that the last couple of years haven't been great. Which, you know, if someone said that to me when they were proposing, I would assume they were hardcore settling. I don't know, it hasn't been long. I mean, I know we haven't known each other for a long time. Go on. Yes, I will. As you know, these last couple of years haven't been easy for me. But meeting you... Yeah, meeting you has been the best thing that could have possibly happened. I agree. What? I agree I'm the best thing that could have happened to you. <laughs> Again, he doesn't even know that Sherlock is alive. And in fact, John's proposal is interrupted when he learns that Sherlock faked his death. So I think you find this vintage exception if you're like in the social qualities of the org with uh, some of the color of the new. No, sorry, not now. Like a gaze from a crowd of strangers, suddenly one is aware of staring into the face of an old friend. Now look, seriously, could you just... They don't immediately fall back into their old life, though. But we can see that John isn't happy with this choice. He stares at the ceiling thinking of Sherlock while his wife sleeps beside him. Sherlock is shown to be devastated by John not accepting him back in all kinds of ways. One of them is the cases he solves involving romance. We have another lying spouse. Why didn't you assume it was your wife? Because I've always had total faith in her. No, it was because you emptied it. Weight loss, hair dye, Botox affair. Lawyer, next! And Sherlock empathizing with a woman who lost the love of her life because of a deception. And you really thought he was the one, didn't you? The love of your life. Sherlock tries to go on cases with Molly, but things don't work out between them, even professionally. And that's because they aren't romantically compatible. The audience is told that them trying to work together might as well be them trying to go out. Would you like to Have solve dinner. crimes? They establish the same thing. It's clear that Sherlock would rather be with John in every sense of the word. Are you sure about this? Absolutely. Should I be making notes? If it makes you feel better. And it's just that that's what John says he does, so if I'm being John... I mean, John, you're being yourself. It's gonna be your new arrangement, is it? Just giving it a go. All right. So, John? Not really in the picture anymore. Yes. Shut up! <laughs> I won't insult your intelligence by explaining it to you. Now, please, insult away. Forget it. You can't. 
Why would someone go to all that trouble? Why indeed, John? John gets sucked back into his life with Sherlock in less than 24 hours, and he's so caught up that he forgets to propose. Have you set a date? Uh, well, we've got May. Oh, spring wedding. Yeah. Well, once I've actually got engaged. Yeah. We were interrupted last time. Yeah. Contrast. There is one happy couple in this episode, but we'll be coming back to them later. The wedding episode beats us over the head with several unhappy couples, and specifically lots of references to infidelity. Sherlock is still lonely just before the wedding, reminding us that he needs a relationship to happily complete his arc. And specifically, the relationship he's missing is with John. Janine flirts with him, but it doesn't go beyond a comment that Sherlock is textually frightened by. Hey, Miss Mr. Holmes. I'm very pleased to meet you. But no sex, okay? Sorry. You don't have to look so scared. He starts pointing out other men instead, including a divorced doctor. That's the sort of thing you're looking for, the man of the band blues, your best bet. Recently divorced doctor with the ginger cat. A barn conversion and a history of erectile dysfunction. <laughs> and a man compulsively cheating on his partner. Long-term relationship, compulsive cheat. Seriously? Waterproof cover and a smartphone. Yet his complexion doesn't indicate outdoor work. It suggests he's in the habit of taking his phone into the shower with him, which means he often receives texts and emails he'd rather went unseen. John's marriage could be the exemplar to disprove the pattern if the whole episode weren't about Sherlock and John's love for each other, making the wedding just another part of the unhappy statistic. We're still being told to look for an affair. We also start getting hints of what John is actually looking for in a relationship. He has a type. He's pretty calm at the reception, but he lights up when he sees Sholto. Oh, God, wow. Is that he came? <laughs> this is his wedding day. It seems like that kind of look would be reserved for his wife. Apparently not. He's more into reclusive, brave men who can lead him into adventure. Press and the family's going in hell. He gets more death threats than you. Well, I wouldn't count on that. John says he's the most unsociable man he's ever met. He is. He's the most unsociable. Mm. Ah, that's why he's bouncing around him like a puppy. Sholto is coded like an ex. So why don't we see him anymore? Who? Your previous commander, Sholto. Previous commander? I met X. They're such good friends. Why does he barely even mention him? He mentions him all the time to me. He never shuts up about him. Oh, Sherlock. Neither of us were the first, you know. Even if nothing ever actually happened between them. And John isn't getting what he got with Sholto with Mary. We're told time and again that Sherlock is the one filling that role in his life now. Mr. Holmes, you and I are similar, I think. Yes, I think we are. We'll hear later that John knows that he's attracted to this type, but that he specifically chose his wife because she wasn't like that. John, you are addicted to a certain lifestyle. You're abnormally attracted to dangerous situations and people, so is it truly such a surprise that the woman you fall in love with conforms to that pattern? But she wasn't supposed to be like that. Why is she like that? He's not attracted to her. What does that comparison imply? In his best man speech, Sherlock alludes to a touching case. Touching cases? She's going to ring the doorbell. Oh, no, she's changed her mind. But she's going to do it. No, she's leaving. She's leaving. <clears throat> oh, she's coming back. She's a client. She's boring. I've seen those symptoms before. Hmm? Oscillation on the pavement always means there's a love affair. That scene is so vague that it practically begs you to check the blog entry, which is helpfully titled Happily Ever After. Just in case we couldn't have gotten by ourselves from reading it that this is how the story will end. What happens? A client comes to Sherlock claiming that her husband is having an affair, presenting the main problem as his lying. But it then comes out that she was blackmailed into marrying him because he knew her sexuality and that she's actually in love with another woman. Sherlock encourages her to be with the person she loves and she Sure enough, she divorces her spouse, comes out, and is publicly with the woman she loves. And they lived happily ever after. Real subtle there, guys. In this episode, Mrs. Hudson's marriage starts being set up as a parallel to John's, which is hilarious when you consider that this is the first thing we ever hear about Mrs. Hudson's marriage. Oh, Mrs. Hudson, the landlady, she's given me a special deal, owes me a favor. A few years back, her husband got himself sentenced to death in Florida. I was able to help out. So you stopped her husband being executed? Oh, no, I ensured it. Sherlock. <laughs> In case that wasn't enough, though. Got him with a really bad crowd. Right. 
And then I found out about all the other women. I didn't have a clue. So when he was actually arrested for blowing someone's head off, it was quite a relief, to be honest. And then we get the Mayfly Man, a man named John who dates a string of women ending with a nurse without feeling any emotional connection to them. Why would he date all of those women and not return their calls? You're missing the obvious, mate. Am I? He's a man. Why would he change his identity? Well, maybe he's married. These comparisons are getting a lot more direct because the writers wanted to be clear that John and Mary still aren't the couple we should be looking for. In the next episode, we open with a woman being blackmailed through the man she is in love with because of someone else he was involved with. In 1982, your husband corresponded with Ellen Catherine Driscoll. That was before I knew him. The letters were lively, loving, some would say explicit. She was 15. Later in the episode, Sherlock is blackmailed because the man he's in love with is involved with someone dangerous. Well, look how you care about John Watson. Your damsel in distress. Sherlock's pressure point is his best friend, John Watson. John Watson's pressure point is his wife. I own John Watson's wife. I own Mycroft. Just as we know not to root for Lord Smallwood and the 15-year-old, we should know not to root for John and Mary. Also, in the beginning of this episode, we're told that Molly and Tom have broken up in the same episode that John and Mary have done nothing but bicker over Sherlock. Sorry your engagement's over. I'm fairly grateful for the lack of a ring. <laughs> but is it Sherlock Holmes you want? Because I've not seen him in ages. About a month. It was Sherlock Holmes. See? That does happen. So again, the other relationship introduced in The Empty Hearse is failing, letting us know again that John and Mary aren't the endgame couple. This is before the reveal of Mary's true identity, mind you. Meanwhile, Sherlock is dating a woman now, but that's completely fake too. You lied to me. You lied and lied. I exploited the fact of our connection. When? Hmm? Just once would have been nice. Oh. I was waiting until we got married. That was never gonna happen. Why though? Why couldn't they have Sherlock dating a woman after the wedding and John and Mary being happily married with a baby on the way? That gives both of them relationships, resolving that part of the narrative. Right? It doesn't though. Even leaving aside the fake relationship, John clearly isn't happy. This isn't the resolution. Mary isn't who John is meant to end up with. This is made all the more clear when she's revealed to be a villain and shoots Sherlock. You. What have I ever done? Hmm? My whole life to deserve you. Mary isn't a viable option for John. That leaves only Sherlock. And again, at this point, we get a glimpse of the future he wants. Did you write this? Oh, that silly old thing. You mustn't read that. Mathematics has seemed terribly fatuous now. Now, no humming, you. <sighs> Complete flake, my wife, but happens to be a genius. She was a mathematician. Gave it all up for children. I could never bear to argue with her. I'm something of a moron myself. But she's unbelievably hot. He's lovely mum and dad, a fine example of married life, I get that. The attractive genius and the stalwart man beside her. A fine example of married life indeed. It's an ideal he'll reach with Sherlock, not Mary. What about Sherlock then? At this point, if you want to be really obtuse, there are still three options for him. He can end up with Moriarty, which you'll remember is how Sherlock loses the story. He could end up with Molly, even though we've been told time and again that they aren't compatible and that they both know he'd much rather be with John. Or he can end up with John, which we've been told time and again is the option to root for. Does that still hold true? Will we get a full 90 minutes to explore what Sherlock is thinking and what he wishes would happen? He clearly thinks that John and Mary are doomed to fail because of him. You have recently married a man of a seemingly kindly disposition who has now abandoned you for an unsavory companion of dubious morals. You've come to this agency as a last resort in the hope that reconciliation may still be possible. Mary. John. Why in God's name are you pretending to be a client? Because I could think of no other way to see my husband. Husband. It was an affair of international intrigue. It was a murdered country squire. Nevertheless, matters were pressing. I don't mind you going, my darling. I mind you leaving me behind. But what could you do? Well, what do you do? Except wander around, taking notes, looking surprised. His dream is filled with unhappy relationships, in fact. It's a shotgun wedding. He knew her out in the States. Promised her everything. Marriage, 
position. And then he had his way with her and threw her over, left her abandoned and penniless. Amelia thought that she found happiness with Riccoletti, but he was a brute too. Despite this, he's afraid all of that isn't enough, that John will leave him for Mary anyway. I, I thought I was losing you. I thought perhaps we were neglecting each other. Well, you're the one who moved out. I was talking to Mary. We have a case. We have a real-life problem right now. Getting to that, it's next on the list. Just let me do this. No, everyone always lets you do whatever you want. That's how you got in this state. John, please. I'm not playing this time, Sherlock. Not anymore. When you're ready to go to work, give me a call. I'm taking Mary home. You're what? Mary's taking me home. Better. And that he's doomed to be left with Moriarty. This is how we end, you and I. Always here. Always together. No. Don't try to fight it. Lie back and lose. Shall we go over together? It has to be together, doesn't it? At the end, it's always just you and me. That moment of silence in this scene is crucial. What happens next will decide everything. Sherlock is faced with his ultimate doom, being tied to Moriarty forever. So how he gets out of this situation will tell us if not how things will end, at the very least how Sherlock would like them to end. Does he save himself, proving that he was only ever a solitary detective? That they aren't changing the story? That there really is no update here? No, someone saves him. Fine, is it his brother? Obviously not. The situation is far too romantic for familial ties to fix things. That's the whole point of this video. There has to be a romantic resolution. Okay, so what about our other options? Is it Irene, or Janine, or Molly, or even Mary? Of course not. Because if they're changing the story, or or rather, if they're unveiling the true story that was left untold in the canon, there's really only ever been one option. At the end, it's always just you and me! <laughs> <laughs> Professor, if you wouldn't mind stepping away from my friend, I do believe he finds your attention a shade annoying. That's not fair, there's two of you. There's always two of us. Don't you read the strand? Not four, not three, two since the strand. The ending Sherlock wants is the same as the one we want. He wants John to be the one to save him from Moriarty. And since we've established that John's marriage is doomed because he'd rather be with Sherlock, we know how this has to end. And there will be hints of more love affairs in series four. I suspect a lot more. In fact, we already know that we'll be revisiting a case that Sherlock got wrong the first time around. But I'll touch on that more in the video I'll be doing on the supplementary materials. This is just one of the many ways the writers have told us that Sherlock and John ending up in a romantic relationship is the the intended goal of the story. Although it won't end when they're together. They'll keep on solving cases. It'll just finally be presented the way the stories always should have been. Two men in love and their ridiculous adventures. And I think that ending will extend far beyond this show. Once people see how easily and naturally Holmes and Watson fit into a romantic relationship, almost as if they were meant to be in one the whole time, I think that people will stop telling the stories in any other way and will have won. Thank you for watching this video. I referenced John's blog a few times in the video, which you can find linked below. Also, M-theory. I alluded to read M-theory. I just do that now. Read it. It's good. It's several hundred pages. Fun way to spend your weekend. <laughs> you can support TGLC Explained by contributing subtitles and captions. Or by donating on Patreon, where I've started putting out little bits of bonus content for people generous enough to donate to the show. It's not a lot, so don't donate just for that, but I'm just letting you know. Next up is an in-depth look at the character of Mary Morstan and how her inclusion supports TJLC. Until then, thank you for watching and get ready to believe. <laughs>